Thank you so much for two amazing papers, and I feel like we really like crunch it you know, all over the place. So welcome, welcome. Any questions? Allison. Um, I actually have a question for, question for each of you that are very different. So I'll just start chronologically with um, Samuel. Samuel, Samuel. Um, so I'm, I was really struck by this idea that uh, the Japanese were understood the clock as an automata, and I'm curious if you think it's if it has something to do with the fact that it was still an agrarian society, so timekeeping was perhaps not yet important, and whether or not they had already either started producing or seeing their own automata, because I know there is a tradition of, I think, Japanese atom, like, well, now we think of robots, but uh, I believe there were dolls that were automata that were produced by the Japanese. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your question. So, I didn't really manage, uh, I didn't really have time to get into this uh, specifically, but Japanese um, had a, sort of a machine for keeping time uh, during the 16th and 17th century, and it's what we call incense clocks. And they're very reliable. So it's not like the clock comes from a European, uh, comes from Europe and it's a better technology. You know, incense clocks, are actually very um, precise and manage to uh, calculate time very efficiently. It's just a different way of con conceiving of time that's adapted by uh, the Japanese. So I think you know we're it's 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 a more complex negotiation than sim simply oh this is a better technology let's adapt it. You know it's it's something that is again a negotiation of why we should adapt it maybe because it represents something that is is related to power, to propaganda, but also to self-sufficiency. And that goes to your question about uh, the auto automaton. So that develops really in the 18th century. It's what we call karakuri ningyo, which means basically uh, you know, self-moving doll. But that develops basically from the clocks that I was showing here into something that is pretty similar to what you get in Europe at the same time. Yeah. Um, great, thanks. Um, so um, I had no idea when <laughs> um, so I have just another question that's very different for Sam too, and that would be uh, about whether the artists are practicing abstraction, whether they would have been trained in, I guess, social realist painting, and whether or not you see that as uh, their move towards an abstraction as a kind of a resistance to being used, their work being used for propaganda, and if this has anything if you can, sort of, this could be read at all as a kind of an anticipation of the events at Tiananmen Square. I don't know, maybe I'm just being connecting things too strongly. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do I need a, do I need this? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for your question. Um, yes, they were trained uh, in socialist realist painting, especially Chiu Shu was um, actually hired by the uh, Luan district, the cultural district uh, center to make produce posters. Um, but uh, so obviously, uh, I mean, part of my argument in my larger uh, paper and thesis <coughs> details this kind of um, survival of these ideas of, um, of modernist painting in Shanghai through uh, the very kind of, through material means, but also through discussion and kind of oral history between this um, older generation that traveled uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, so Chiu De Shu, for example, was, was aware of, um, I mean, he flipped through books at these painters' homes. So he was trained in socialist realism, but uh, did, have a, you know, some hints to what other uh, possibilities there was for him to like explore. And um, right after the Cultural Revolution, it was still a very sensitive time, uh, especially be before 1979. Uh, um, and he did suffer from um, sort of
sort of, um, you know, campaigns of being re-educated uh, after, after the first exhibition he organized. Um, so it was definitely, abstraction was definitely a kind of response to this um, education and to these, mm -hmm. this decade of this, well, era of like uh, um, omnipresent pro propaganda. Um, I can't say, I can't really speak to it uh, relating to Tiananmen because uh, well, first of all, because it's a, the local history is very important. Um, I see Shang the events and the development of contemporary art in Shanghai being quite different from what was happening in Beijing at the time, um, which isn't to say that they weren't, they, they don't have any relationship, but um, from the conversations that I have had the opportunity to have with some of these artists, um, there is no mention of Tiananmen ever really as being this kind of linear progression. Yeah, this is also for uh, Your title of your talk is Inventing Abstraction. Like, isn't uh, like in Chinese art history for thousands of years of Chinese art, was abstraction was totally absent, and was it only a reaction to the uh, Cultural Revolution? Uh, you suggested that it's very Eurocentric, and so you say, uh, in other words, you are the. Uh, Chu De Shu was inspired by the European style abstraction, maybe. But was the abstraction art of a, uh, uh, abstraction art was totally absent from the Chinese art history for the for thousands of years, or was, was it something completely new to them? Is it you can say that uh, unequivocally? Um, I'm not claiming that. Was absent from Chinese uh, art, but I'm, I think the the twentieth century understanding of it is very different from what um, what abstraction in Chinese painting is or is understood to be. Uh, I think I guess. Um, if I speak to my sort of first encounters with like um, with traditional Chinese painting, I tend to see that there is definitely abstraction uh, because precisely because of the movement within it and the way in which it is uh, almost performed so rapidly and um, you know there's also there exists a lot of, of whites of void spaces in Chinese painting, something that doesn't necessarily exist in, um, you know, in, in Western painting. Uh, there's not such an emphasis on, you know, scientific ideas of perspective. And they, they didn't look like Chinese art. They look like something European. The, the paintings I showed. The that you showed. Yeah. They, they don't look. I mean, at one at first glance, they don't look like a, a Chinese art. So I'm just saying, is it because they're trying to copy yeah. on the well, European style of structure? I think what you're raising is, is, is very much what um, Beatriz is, and, and others like her are, are interested in doing, is in confronting those expectations of what Chinese art should look like over the, from, from 5,000 years of tradition into what it is really today and, uh, and or in the recent history. And what's also interesting is that I think the idea, idea to think of aesthetic uh, in terms of movements is not just an aesthetic movement, but it's often, and as this case is, um, it aligned with social movements and particular uh, political movements that are very time specific, right? So it's really depending on what period of history you're coming through. So thank you for that. Um, there was a question there. Do you have a question? Thank you. Um, I have a question for Samuel. Thank you both for really excellent papers. Um, this is a bit of a historical question that comes partly from ignorance. Um, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the intersection between the qu 
clock and the perspective imagery uh, are a little bit more about it. Um, and the reason I'm asking is I'm, I'm wondering if there's any kind of colonial aspirations embedded within this, the, the conjunction of these two, this, these two images or these two concepts of time and perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking particularly of the use of perspective techniques in uh, map making techniques and cartographic techniques. And also, if I'm not mistaken, but I wish I could remember better, is the professional, the link, the professional link between people who did measure time and who were also map makers. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was just wondering if you have thoughts about that or if you see any kind of connection there. Um, well, that's, that's a really interesting question. And um, there is, you know, I'm kind of um, debating on if, you know, are we dealing with perspective as something that has sort of an ideology that's kind of what you're, as something that kind of is to occupy, in, you know, space in some way, or to, to, to conquer it in that way. Um, the thing is, is that when I read, and I, you know, I think that there is some of that in map making, map making and, you know, in picture making at that time, there's a, there's a desire in the Renaissance, and it goes with the colonial expansion, to appropriate space in a very violent and direct way. But then I read the records, and that's where it gets more complicated, because, um, and I mostly have been reading records about uh, what Europeans thought of Japanese screens, and they don't use mathematical perspective in the same way, but they call them perspective too. So the term perspective is not specifically related to the mathematical um, use of, you know, mathematical perspective, you know, one point perspective. It's, it's applied to a different set of imagery at the time. So it becomes more complicated to ascribe it to one type of imagery. It might just be that, you know, people apply uh, uh, an ideology to a specific object at a certain time, rather than, you know, perspective is actually just about conquering ter territory. I think it depends on who's using it for what and for what reason. I think we really have to remember that. Okay, I think we have time for two brief questions. So maybe Mr. Gober and then Nicola. <coughs> the term network usually denotes some elements of parity between the parties involved. And yet, in both of these cases, we know that East and West looked at things very differently, either in terms of the notion of time, the idea of abstraction itself. We know there are elements of colonialism and anti-colonialism. So how exactly does one characterize these net, this idea of network as it applies in, this, in these cases? I'm having a little difficulty here uh, seeing how one can balance the various variables here because there are some elements that deal with commonalities, others that are totally different, others that are hierarchical, etc. So how exactly does one circumscribe this idea of network that you're both using? Well, um, um, if I can briefly also just speak to you, that's what's exciting about this research, is that works have, have not had that much attention paid to, and so so these, 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 um, these studies are about unearthing what, what, what the implications are, what, what is meaningful about these transnational um, connections that we're finding more, more about. If I can just answer you, yes, you know, there's, there's an uncertainty here that we're dealing with. No doubt. A little louder, please. There's an uncertainty here that we're dealing yeah. with. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there's an uncertainty we're dealing with here. And it's true, it doesn't fit maybe the paradigms that, we re that were applied before to our history. But that's the exciting thing about these objects, is that they don't fit into the categories that we necessarily applied before, and they escape them in some way. And maybe, you know, the fact that we don't know, and the fact that we have to deal with it, that contingency, which I was talking about, when objects travel and modify themselves, that's something new in our field, and especially in the 16th century, and the 17th century, where everything before was just, you know, author, date, place. And I have to think about that more and more 
with these objects that are traveling from different spaces and applying and you know accommodating different identities. I'm not saying that there's you know a singular method, but I think that's a good thing. I don't think it's a bad thing. Okay, but the thing that worries me would be to some extent, if I may quote Edward Said here, the literary historian, who once wrote that the tragedy in a way of the colonial experience mm -hmm. historically is that it distorts the perception of both the receiver and and the received. So if we're dealing with distorted perceptions on, mm -hmm. on both sides, how does one manage to come up with some workable way of dealing with the interaction between these different cultures? It seems to me that's a problem that we're still struggling with as one might even argue that there are elements of this in the current whole question of Islam, for example, but that's a whole different other ballgame. But nevertheless, there's the question is how does one negotiate these cultural exchanges when, when the perceptions are so complicated and so contradictory, etc.? But that's Thank what I'm you, saying. Oh, sorry. I mean, Thank you. Sorry. Okay, I just wanted to squeeze yeah. in one last question yeah. there. Thank you, Mr. Gold Nicolas. I was very, uh, for Samuel, I was very intrigued by the monstrance clock yeah. um, because typically a monstrance is where the Eucharist is, is put on display for ad, you know, adoration. And you mentioned, though, that there was a connection between a kind of theistic view of, of the clock. So is, is, is the monstrance there to sort of highlight that connection between the two? Yeah, in my large, I mean, this is a reduced kind of version of my paper, but yes, you know, we. We have to think about you know the 16th and 17th centuries as a period where religion, whether good or bad, is still there, and it's still linked to scientific discovery in some way, in trying to you know find out about the world in relation to God. So in the question of time, in the question of microcosm, that is integrally related to um, the clock itself, which is seen as uh, a microcosm of you know God's universe. A lot of people will talk you know in theology or in the philosophical text as the universe is a well uh, winded up clock mm -hmm. similar to God's own creation. Yeah. So that's effectively, you know, that, that clock it does pertain to that. And a lot of other uh, clocks actually have, you know, this kind of, like you said, theistic dimension to them. That has so to there's, them. it's a tradition, there's multiple versions yeah. of those. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of clocks that for, you know, that have kind of almost universal dimensions showing the, the faces of the moon that have Christ on them. It's really something that you have to kind of, you know, science and religion aren't divided up right. yet. It's of course, yeah. still really related to each other. But it was so intriguing mm -hmm. because Thank you. Thank you oh. so much. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful way um, to wrap up. And indeed, it is about clocks and times. And yeah. Mikhail Signal, before the security card comes and tosses us all out, <laughs> so honestly. But so please, with a uh, with all due respect, please help me welcome uh, the pa two panelists for today, uh, for this afternoon, and also thank you for all of you for, for coming. And um, 